Hi everybody, welcome to another Spectrum Economics video. Today we're going to be talking about specialization. This is something that's talked about quite a bit in economics and is actually quite an important concept. So what, what do we mean by specialization? As you can see in this example here, we've got a factory production line of uh, motor vehicles. As it's going along, there's different things happening to this vehicle along each step of the way. So it looks like they're adding something here to the interior. As it goes on, it adds something else. So this is um, specialization in terms of um, production. Okay, here we're looking at uh, specialization again in terms of production. And this is taking us back, um, I'm guessing, maybe about 100 years. As you can see here, you've got people working on the factory floor. And it looks like they may be adding very, very small things, possibly to do these little bundles here. I can't quite see what they might be doing. But let's imagine, for example, you know, you're dealing with textiles, dealing with clothes, and maybe each person is a button adder. So they're adding buttons to um, shirts, for example, and that's their specialization. Each person is specialized at adding buttons. You maybe having some people specialize in maybe adding zips, maybe some people specializing in doing the stitching and doing the sewing. So this is another form of specialization, but it's very much focused around production. And uh, specialization, as I'll talk about later on, doesn't necessarily have to be around the production line, but that is just one way of looking at it. Another form of specialization could be in regards to the training that you've done. Like, for example, I'm an economist, and I spent many, many years training to become an economist. I got my uh, bachelor's, and I got my master's, and then I worked for, for many years within the government and all that, honing on my skills. So I'm a specialized economist. As you can see here, this lady, she's a hairdresser, and she would have spent a couple of years training as a hairdresser and practicing as a hairdresser. And when you dedicate that amount of time, in terms of picking up a trade or picking up a skill and you become well quite good at it that's where you'd rather land up when you actually enter the workforce after the training but that's not always the case as I explained in a second you often get a situation where you have too many people of a particular skill and then unfortunately they can't necessarily utilize their training so they may end up in another area like for example a hairdresser may end up as a gardener that's not her area of expertise, and it's something what we'd call underemployment. She's not fully utilizing her skills, but you know, people need to get a job, people need to earn money in order to survive. So she's opted for a job in gardening rather than um, hairdressing, simply because there's too many hairdressers. And that could apply to many occupations that we've seen, you know, many times in the world that people who are highly qualified end up in positions that are far less uh, qualified far less requirements for those jobs simply because there are too many people of that particular skill. So I'm going to explain the theory a little bit behind specialization. I'm going to keep it fairly simple. So you're going to have two people here. We have Mary and we have Sue. And basically there's two tasks that they can do. One is collect wood and the other is to pick apples. And as you can see here, we have Mary. She's able to collect 100 kilograms of wood within an hour or she can pick 20 apples. So assuming, you know, if she can get 100 kilograms of wood in one hour, 200 in two hours, 300 in three hours, and so on. So it's not going to have any diminishing returns to this. And the same here we have with Sue. So she's able to collect 80 kilograms of wood or eight apples. So with her one hour time, she could spend it getting apples, she'd get eight, or she could be collecting wood and she'd get 80 kilograms. As you can see, uh, Mary is more proficient at uh, collecting wood, and she's also more proficient at picking apples. So obviously she can't do both. Now, uh, Sue has to do something as well. So what should Sue do? Should Sue uh, pick apples, or should she collect wood? So this is how we're going to compare the two now. Mary has what we call an absolute advantage over Sue. Mary can collect 100 kilograms of wood compared to Sue's 80 kilograms. She can also pick 20 apples compared to Sue's 8 apples. But Mary, unfortunately, can't do all of the work, so she can only do one or the other. She can collect wood or she can collect ap uh, pick apples, and uh, Sue would have to do the other task. So which one is which? Let's just have a look at the ratio here in terms of kilograms of wood compared to apples. So you look at Mary. So Mary is actually able to collect 5 kilograms of wood for every apple picked, whereas Sue is able to pick 10 kilograms of wood for every apple she's able to pick. So how does that factor in in terms of deciding who should do what? We can say that Mary has a comparative advantage at picking apples 
where Sue has a comparative advantage at collecting wood. Remember the ratio I showed you just now? That's simply because the amount of wood that uh, Mary has to sacrifice in order to pick up an apple, collect an apple, is less. It's only 5 kilograms. Whereas Sue, if she's going to collect apples, she would miss out on collecting 10 kilograms of wood. So therefore, she's better off collecting wood, whereas Mary is better off at collecting, uh, at picking apples. So let's now imagine that both girls work for a total of 8 hours in a day. So you've got Mary now, she's picking apples. So she'll be able to pick 160 apples in those 8 hours. And we've got Sue who's collecting wood. And she'll be able to collect 640 kilograms of wood. So what does that mean? So we're going to have now Mary with a big stack of apples. And we're going to have Sue with a large stack of wood. So now they can do what we call, they can trade. So how will they trade and how will they go about doing that? So let's take a look at Mary. So as you remember... For every one apple that Mary picks, she'd have to forego collecting five kilograms of wood. So if the price of uh, one apple is greater than five kilograms of wood, then she would be willing to sell her apples. Whereas Sue, on the other hand, she'd actually require 10 kilograms of wood before she would sell her apples. Whereas if you actually have less than 10 kilograms of wood, then Sue would actually want to buy apples. So you can see here from this um, diagram, we have this green area. So from five onwards, Mary is willing to sell apples. And from 10 and below, Sue is willing to buy apples. So that means Mary and Sue can come to some sort of agreement around trading apples for wood. And that would be somewhere between 5 kilograms of wood to 10 kilograms of wood for each apple. So let's assume for argument's sake that they've agreed that one apple is worth 8 kilograms of wood. So you can see 8 kilograms falls between that 5 to 10 kilogram range. So let's just imagine now that Sue trades all her wood, it's like 640 kilograms of wood, and in return she gets 80 apples. So that is 640 divided by 8. So she now has 80 apples. So that would have taken Sue 80 divided by 8. Remember she takes um, one hour to to pick eight apples so 80 divided by eight that gives you 10 hours so she would have had to work 10 hours to get those 80 apples but instead she only worked eight hours to get the 640 kilograms of wood which she traded with mary so let's now take a look at mary so mary now has acquired 640 kilograms of wood but she still has 80 apples so that's 640 kilograms of wood that would have taken her over six hours to collect, wouldn't it? That would have been six hours and 24 minutes, I believe. And the apples, that would have taken her 80 divided by 20, another four hours. So to get what she's got here at the end, it would have taken her 10 hours and 24 minutes. But instead, she only spent eight hours picking apples. So as you can see, she's actually better off in terms of time saved. So both of them have benefited from specialization in this case. So from this example, we can see that specialization can actually be a great help. And we can see both Sue and Mary have benefited. Even though Mary is actually more proficient than Sue at picking apples and collecting wood, she was actually better off at just focusing on picking apples and letting Mary focus on collecting wood. And then when they exchanged, she actually got more for the amount of time that she put in than if she had done it herself. So that was ten over 10 hours work. For her and uh, Sue was about 10 hours work as well. So they both saved two hours, two hours plus time to end up with what they got. So as you can see here, specialization in regards to trade can be quite beneficial. But this is where the quandary comes. If we look purely from a production basis, we can actually see that specialization is great. You get people specializing in tasks that they're really good at and eventually you will get a higher output. That, of course, was assuming that the people that are specializing in these areas are happy to do so. As you looked at the production line, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people aren't necessarily happy about that. And you may get some problems where people are no longer motivated because their jobs are very boring and very repetitive. And if they actually had a few different activities in their life, they could actually be more productive. Because the basic example we've assumed that you know one hour you can get eight apples for example for sue so the next hour you get 16 and then you get 24 and so on and so on it'd be accumulated but in reality people 
do get a little bit bored doing the same activities time and time again. And there's also the problem as well that people get locked into a particular profession and it lacks their level of mobility and career-wise it might not be great for them either, especially if people are getting replaced by robots in particular industries and that is the only skill that they have. They find they've got a skill that's now become redundant and because they haven't trained up in any other area, that is not particularly good for them. So as you can see, like I mentioned before, from production purpose, it actually um, it is very good for the companies employing people because they have that level of efficiency generally. And again, they can replace them maybe at a later date. But it's not so good for the people that are working in a sense that they, you could have that boredom, you've got limits in terms of career development. And there, yeah, there's a lot of disadvantages of having that compared to having a more broader horizon by having a wider skill set. I'm not sure if many, sure if many of you are familiar with uh, Brave New World. This puts a little bit of a negative spin on specialization. And if you watch the movie or if you've read the book, it will explain to you how people are put into various categories, I think almost when they're born, and they have to literally live up in a particular stream of specialization at a particular level and is very very focused and it's people basically keeping each other in step basically forced to focus on a particular area and if things get overly specialized you can have quite a loss of freedom in terms of that's something worth bear in mind as you can see specialization in theory it could be a great thing and it could be a great thing in terms of improving production but many people that get themselves locked into specialization into certain specialist roles don't benefit too much. I can take myself, for example, as an economist, I'm a specialist, but the specialization is reasonably broad and a lot of the work that I do can be applied to a lot of different areas. So it's, it's good to have those sort of broader skills, even though it's still within a particular specialization to keep yourself more interested. Anyway, this brings us now, brings me now to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sure some of you have some thoughts in regards to specialization. This video is basically just to introduce the idea, explain how it works, because I know there's a lot of negative feelings about it, and like I mentioned before, there are good reasons behind that. But there's also a logic behind it as well, So, and that's important that people understand that theory and why many companies actually use specialization, why something that's known as Fordism was so successful because of that level of specialization and such. Though it's, that was back, oh, sorry, almost a hundred years ago now when that was becoming more and more popular. It seems to be becoming a little bit less popular these days as most people would rather diversify their skills a little bit more. But anyway, thank you for watching. If you're on, um, DTube, it would be great if you could, uh, upvote this. And if you're not currently following me, please follow me. I've got a lot of, uh, content. I put out posts on a very, very regular basis as well as DTube videos as well. If you're on YouTube, I've got a lot of stuff going on there as well. I've got a number of different areas. I look at things like microeconomics, cost-benefit analysis. I do my uh, vegan economics videos. I've also got vegan economics posts as well that I have on um, Steemit. So yeah, for, that's for the Steemit guys. And if you are watching this on YouTube, I recommend that you would go over to Steemit. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. It's, it's more than just videos. There's some really good blogs. And there's um, some good photographs and all sorts of various different areas. So it's definitely worth having a look at that. Anyway, thank you for watching and uh, hopefully you'll be watching a few more of my videos. Goodbye.